South Korea and the U.S. confirm North Korea has launched two short-range ballistic missiles from its west coast. It's the regime's fourth missile test in roughly two weeks. The stakes just got higher, a lot higher. The Trump administration designates China a currency manipulator amid the intensifying trade tensions with Beijing. It comes a day after China devalued the yuan. Plus, a typhoon is approaching South Korea. It will bring heavy rain and gusty winds to large parts of the country over the next couple of days. So, North Korea has fired yet more missiles into the East Sea, did so on Tuesday morning local time. Two missiles were fired around four hours ago now, so roughly 6 a.m. local time. It's the second launch in four days and fourth, as I just said, in less than a fortnight. Our Kim Jian is at Seoul's Defence Ministry uh, with the details about these launches and uh, some more details are just starting to filter in now. Yes, Mark. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff says North Korea launched the two short-range missiles in the early hours of Tuesday towards the East Sea at around 5.24 a.m. and 5.36 a.m. Korea time from its southwestern county of Quiet in Hwangye province. The missiles had an altitude of around 37 kilometers and flew some 450 kilometers, recording a maximum flight speed of Mach 6.9. That's around 8,500 kilometers an hour. The North had fired two sh- two medium-range ballistic northern missiles from the same province in 2016. The Joint Chiefs of Staff said the missiles fired today seem to have similar characteristics to the short-range ballistic missiles fired by the North on July 25th and said it's working with the U.S. to verify further information about the missiles fired today while monitoring the situation for additional launches. Today's firing is the fourth such launch in less than two weeks. Uh, last Friday, North Korea fired two short-range projectiles into the EC. It had launched two short-range ballistic missiles just two days before that. According to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they were all short-range and ballistics and were fired in the early hours in a northeasterly direction towards the EC, all flying at altitudes of less than 50 kilometers. The the Joint Chiefs of Staff believe the North test fired a new type of short-range ballistic missile, North Korea's version of Russia's Iskander-class missile, which is believed to be harder to intercept due to its complicated flight trajectory, although the Joint Chiefs of Staff made reassurances that they are able to neutralize the missiles by the North with the existing Patriot anti-missile system. The missiles were presumed to have been launched from the ground using a transporter erector launcher, which is used to move missiles to a desired launch location. We'll have to see if that applies to today's launch. And that means the missiles are now bound to a fixed launch site and the North's movements are therefore harder to predict. Mark? And, uh, Gion, today's launches came just 24 hours or so after South Korea and the U.S. began their uh, scaled-down combined military exercise as scheduled. Uh, North Korea already said that it wasn't happy about this fact. That's right. The crisis management staff training kicked off on Monday as a preliminary session in the run-up to their summertime command post exercise, which is expected to start this Sunday and continue for about three weeks. The drill is aimed at testing South Korea's initial operational capacity or capability for the envisioned transfer of the wartime operational control from Washington to Seoul. Issuing a statement right after the firing Tuesday, North Korea's uh, foreign ministry said it could seek a new road other than engagement, calling the joint exercise a violation of a series of joint agreements they signed with the South. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Gion. For that, that was our Kim Gion reporting from Seoul's uh, Defense Ministry about this latest North Korea missile launch. And uh, in response to the launch, senior South Korean officials convened an emergency meeting at the top office, according to Blue House spokesperson Go Min Jong. The meeting began at 7.30 a.m. Korea time, so a couple of hours after the launches, chaired by National Security Advisor Jong Yong, the meeting was also attended by South Korea's Defense Minister 
and the head of Seoul's intelligence agency. A similar meeting was held last Friday when the North fired two short-range missiles. We'll have more details on what was discussed today when we get those details. South Korea's National Assembly has convened its House Steering Committee to grill President Moon Jae-in's top advisers over Japan's trade curbs. The ruling party will likely stress Tokyo's responsibility for escalating tensions and call for stern countermeasures. Opposition parties are expected to slam the government for what they claim is its inability to deal with diplomatic and economic crises. Rival lawmakers will also likely question the top office on the possibility of scrapping a military intel sharing pact with Japan as a response to Tokyo's trade actions. Uh, more about that in just a moment. The session is also expected to cover North Korea's latest provocation and Seoul's response to it. Now, as far as shots across the bow go, this is what you call a serious shot. Following the plunge in value of the Chinese Yuan on Monday, the Trump administration has taken the stunning step of officially designating China a currency manipulator. For some context for you out there, the last time the US took such a drastic step, Bill Clinton was still in the White House. Some analysts say the situation has now shifted from a mere trade war to an all-out currency war. Kim Hyo-sun reports. The U.S. Department of Treasury has designated China as currency manipulator, a historic move that no administration has exercised since 1994. Based on its decision, the Treasury Department said in a statement Monday that Secretary Stephen Mnuchin will engage with the International Monetary Fund to eliminate the unfair competitive advantage created by Beijing's currency moves. He also said Beijing's pattern of actions is also a violation of China's G20 commitments to refrain from competitive devaluation of its currency. This follows President Trump's strong criticism against Beijing on Monday, made as the Chinese yuan dropped to its lowest levels against the U.S. dollar in 11 years. He said in a tweet that this is called, quote, currency manipulation. He also expressed his dissatisfaction in the U.S. Federal Reserve, continuing to push the Fed to cut interest rates to weaken the strong dollar. He also slammed China for stealing American businesses and factories, hurting American jobs through its currency manipulation. The yuan dropped and crossed a psychologically sensitive level of seven to the U.S. greenback on Monday, the lowest level since the global financial crisis in 2008. His comments come less than three months after his old administration decided not to label China a currency manipulator. They also come just days after Trump proposed an additional 10 percent tariff on Chinese imports worth $300 billion that would take effect on September 1st. Some analysts forecast Beijing's tinkering with the yuan and the rapid U.S. designation of China as a currency manipulator could trigger an all-out currency war between Washington and Beijing. Yu Mio-san, Arirang News. Now, as a follow-up to uh, that report, but this happened earlier, China has reportedly halted imports of American agricultural goods in response to President Trump's latest tariff increase proposal. According to a report by Bloomberg on Monday, the Chinese government has asked its state-owned enterprises to suspend purchases of U.S. agricultural goods. Sources also say privately run Chinese uh, companies that received retaliatory tariff waivers on American soybeans from Beijing have stopped purchasing the commodity due to the ongoing uncertainties. This comes as President Trump announced last week his plans to slap 10 percent tariffs on the remaining $300 billion of Chinese imports into the U.S. He accused Beijing of not following through on its pledge to resume purchases of American farm products. Now, following yesterday's Black Monday on the South Korean markets, the country's two major stock markets got off to an even worse start around an hour ago now. We have our Hong Yu on the line with the latest on the market, the market turmoil. Uh, so yesterday, 
The tech-heavy COSDAQ, that plunged to a three-year low. And the main benchmark, COSPI, here in South Korea, had a day to forget too. So it's Tuesday now, and it seems to be getting worse, not better. Mark, local stock markets opened lower than Monday's close with the benchmark Kospi opening at 1900, down 2.39 percent. The cost are plunged another 2.58 percent. As we're speaking, about an hour since South Korea's benchmark Kospi and secondary market Kostak has opened, Kospi is down 30.91 points or 1.59 percent. The Kostak is down 1.35 points or 0.24. 4%. This follows a Black Monday. According to Curry Exchange, Kospi's aggregate value of listed stocks decreased more than 27.5 billion U.S. dollars compared to the previous market close and cost act by 12.8 billion. The cost act dropped to the lowest level since January of 2015 on Monday. The Curry Exchange triggered a cool-off period known as a sidecar during which all program trading is halted for five minutes. Early Tuesday morning, the Korea Exchange held a market inspection conference to examine Monday's plunge. But it wasn't just Korean markets that suffered as Asian markets opened lower on Tuesday as well. Japan's Nikkei dropped 2.79% to 20,134. Wall Street also saw its worst drop of the year as China countered President Trump's tariffs by devaluing the yuan, and this prompted the U.S. to designate China a currency manipulator. The S&P 500 dropped 3% to 2,844 on Monday for its worst loss this year. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 2.9%, and the Nasdaq Composite fell 3.5%. It was the worst percentage drop for all three indexes this year. Okay, Hong Yu, thank you very much for that report. Uh, bad day on the markets, to say the least. Now, staying with uh, economic news, and it's gloomy as well. South Korea recorded its lowest current account surplus in seven years during the first half of this year. The Bank of Korea's figures released Tuesday show the surplus recorded $21.7 billion from January to June. This is largely due to a decrease in trade, with exports and imports falling by 8.5% and 5.1% respectively. A BOK official attributed the decline to the trade war between the US and China and sluggish global trade. Sliding semiconductor prices also took a toll on the country's balance of payments. In June, South Korea posted its highest current account surplus in eight months. However, both exports and imports of goods declined by 16 and 12% respectively. The South Korean government is due to announce measures to bolster the inspection of coal waste imports from Japan in response to Tokyo's export curbs on South Korea. The Ministry of Environment said Monday that it's considering whether to inspect the radioactivity and heavy metal levels of coal waste shipped in from Japan. The ministry explained that while the details have yet to be confirmed, there have been concerns among experts in the public about the possibility contaminated coal could be coming in to South Korea. Japan had that uh, nuclear disaster in 2011, if you remember. The country's imports of coal waste, which is used to make cement, have almost exclusively come from Japan for the past 10 years. Now, South Korea is carefully considering whether to terminate its military intel sharing pact with Japan. Now, some in South Korea are warning against making uh, rash moves, especially when it comes to national security. Others say it's a necessary step that should be taken to punish Tokyo for its aggressive trade measures against Seoul. Oh Jung-hee has this report. South Korea is carefully considering whether to terminate its information sharing agreement with Japan. That's according to South Korea's defense chief at a parliamentary meeting on Monday. Chung kyung do said the government originally wanted to extend the information sharing agreement with Japan by another year, but is now carefully considering scrapping that as Japan recently linked its export curves to security issues. 
We are prudently reviewing the matter, considering various terms comprehensively as there are factors which the public could be insecure about. Nothing has been decided yet. With South Korea and Japan both being U.S. allies, their militaries have been sharing information under a three-year deal which needs to be renewed later this month. That deal, known as the General Security of Military Information Agreement, or GSOMIA, was signed in 2016. According to Seoul's Defense Ministry, Japan has provided Seoul with data gathered by Japan satellites regarding North Korea's nuclear weapons and missiles. And South Korea has been sharing levels 2 and 3 of its three levels of classified military information with Japan. If Seoul looks likely to terminate the deal, this could prompt Washington to step in as a mediator in the trade dispute. Washington sees the information-sharing agreement as a key element of the three-country security cooperation, particularly in achieving the final fully verified denuclearization of North Korea, as well as countering China's influence in Northeast Asia. The deadline for South Korea to notify Japan whether it's terminating Jisomia is August 24th, otherwise it'll be automatically extended for another year. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. The season's eighth typhoon is due to make land along South Korea's southern coast on this Tuesday, bringing heavy showers and relatively powerful gusty winds with it as well. Typhoon Francisco is forecast to slowly then make its way across the Korean peninsula over the coming days, but it will gradually run out of steam uh, before heading out into the East Sea. Lee Sung Jae reports. Typhoon Francisco has South Korea locked in its sights. The storm is forecast to make landfall on the south coast on Tuesday afternoon. The typhoon is small in size, but has developed into a medium-intensity storm. Weather experts say the typhoon will move over the Japanese island of Kyushu before arriving on the Korean Peninsula. Its passage over Japan's landmass will weaken the effect of the typhoon once it arrives in South Korea. The typhoon is forecast to sweep through South Korea's inland regions this week before departing into the East Sea near the eastern coastal city of Sokcho. The typhoon will arrive on Tuesday. By Wednesday, we'll see rain nationwide. Gyeongsang, Gangwon and Yeongdong will see 20 to 50 millimeters of rain an hour. Coastal areas in South Gyeongsangdo province and Gangwon-do province are expected to be hit the hardest with upwards of 200 millimeters of rain. Weather officials are urging residents to take precautions as strong winds of up to 30 meters an hour could cause trees to topple. The season's ninth typhoon, Lakima, is also currently making its way toward the Korean Peninsula and could develop into a super typhoon. However, experts forecast it will likely to veer to Japan or Taiwan instead. Lee seung Arirang News. After two mass shootings, one in Texas and the other in Ohio, which combined left 31 people dead and dozens more wounded, U.S. President Donald Trump uh, has given a televised statement to the nation on the tragedies. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn to our Kim Dami. So, Dami, what did President Trump have to say about the recent attacks? Mark, President Trump called for urgent action to prevent gun violence in the United States. Speaking at the White House on Monday morning, he said all Americans must condemn racism, bigotry and white supremacy. These sinister ideologies must be defeated. Hate has no place in America. Hatred warps the mind, ravages the heart and devours the soul. President Trump then urged for mental health law reforms for better identifying mentally disturbed individuals. 
and he pointed to the internet, social media, and violent video games for radicalizing and disturbing minds. He said he had directed the Justice Department to work with local authorities and social media companies to detect mass shooters before they strike. Early on Monday, the president had urged lawmakers in a tweet to carefully watch potential gun buyers. The statement suggested action could be linked to immigration reform. His remarks at the White House, however, included no mention of immigration. The city's mayor said Monday that President Trump plans to visit El Paso on Wednesday, where the Walmart attack happened. Russian President Vladimir Putin is warning the U.S. withdrawal from the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty could spark an unrestrained arms race. Putin said on Monday that Moscow would be forced to start developing intermediate and shorter-range missiles if it's confident that Washington has launched the production of its own weapons. But he also said Russia is ready to resume full-fledged negotiations on strategic stability and security anytime. The U.S. formally left the accord last Friday after determining Moscow was violating the treaty. July 9, 2019 was the hottest month ever recorded across the world. This is according to a report on Monday by the EU's Copernicus Climate Change Program. Last month was around 0.56 degrees Celsius warmer than the global average temperature between 1981 to 2010. That's slightly hotter than July 2016, the previous record said three years ago. With continued greenhouse gas emissions and its impact on global temperatures, records are expected to fall even faster in the future. Time now for our Life and Info segment, where we focus on information useful for your everyday life and in time for the summer break, the Korea Basic Science Institute is hosting a program for aspiring young scientists. Park Se-young with more. Using an electron microscope, the students learn about cutting-edge nanotechnology and how to analyze materials. They are intrigued by the synthesis of gold nanoparticles and experiences like these help shape the dreams of young scientists. My dream is to become a robotics engineer, but I wanted to come in contact with various fields. I got to think about new dreams and the future. The junior doctor program is held during the summer vacation and offers young students aged between 8 and 16 a chance to experience science. More than 40 institutions are participating with Tedok Inopolis as the center. This year, more than 9,000 students from across the country will gather in Daejeon to participate in around 150 programs. We organize this event to let children see that science is actually really important and is indeed very interesting. Korea's largest youth science experience program is being held at the Korea Basic Science Institute in Daejeon until August 18th. Park Se-young, Arirang News. Now, the Seoul city government is accepting submissions for its I Soul You photo and video contest. The content's theme is coexistence, passion, composure. Videos must be 10 seconds to five minutes long and photos can be both digital and printed. City, uh, the city government will select 59 works for prizes of up to 30 million Korean won or 25,000 U.S. dollars, so some nice prize money on offer. Submissions will be accepted starting today until September 30th through the Idea Nanum Seoul website with application forms downloaded from the Seoul City website. If you are a foreigner watching and want to submit your work, you can do so by emailing isoulu at goodcontest.com. .co.kr winners will be announced by the end of October. Good morning. Starting with the updates on Typhoon Francisco, 
Francisco made landfall on the southeast coast of Japan's Kyushu Island early this morning, and it's forecast to pass over the south of the Korean Peninsula and turn to the northeast, arriving in Busan late tonight before dissipating over the east coast tomorrow. So a typhoon advisory has been issued for parts of the East and South Sea. The Jeju Strait is under a high seas watch. And the weather agency is likely to expand typhoon-related advisories in the east and south of the country. So keep a close eye on the path of Typhoon Francisco. And there will be heavy rain along the east coast tomorrow, but it's going to be drier further west. Intense heat continues though, with much of the country and the heat wave warnings are still in place in central western regions. That's Korea for you, and here's the international weather for beers around the world. Well, that's where we have to leave it for now uh, on this uh, busy news day here in South Korea. Stay tuned to Adidang TV and a reminder that I'll be back today for your next newscast at noon Korea time. So until then, goodbye.